from Chicago, it's Startup Hype Man, the podcast. What's up, everyone? My name is Raj Nation, founder and chief pitch artist at Startup Hype Man, where we help startups, scale-ups, and grown-ups not suck at how they pitch themselves so they stand out to their audience and stand apart from the competition. This podcast is all about bringing you the hearts, the minds, and the stories of leaders in the startup ecosystem, talking through the strategies they have deployed in order to build and grow their companies. And it's officially season 17 of the show, and all season long, we've got a special treat for you, bringing you guests exclusively from the Startup Hype Man client portfolio, giving you a piece of their journey. Before we begin, if you're not a subscriber yet, go ahead and hit the subscribe button. And remember, you can catch all the episodes from our 17 season archive and learn how to pitch your startup at StartupHypeMan.com. All right, get your popcorn ready and get hyped because it's go time. Ladies and gentlemen, making her way to the microphone from Los Angeles, California and currently residing in the Chicagoland area of Illinois. She is the co-founder and CEO of Honest Game. Please welcome Kim Michelson. Thanks for having me. Love that intro. (laughs) Play that anytime you walk into a meeting now. Awesome. (laughs) Like I mentioned, she is Kim Michaelson, CEO and co-founder of Honest Game. All this season on Startup Hype Man, the podcast, we are featuring guests who are all just from the Startup Hype Man client portfolio, both past and present. Uh, I had the honor and opportunity to work with Honest Game very early on. Um, They had a prototype. They had a couple beta users and we worked on their pitch. And it was awesome to just see kind of like the rocket ship that you ended up taking off on. winning 50K, 50K invest with a lot of capital in just a few months. And then that paved the way towards a $2 million raise uh, over the next year. And the growth of the company has just been amazing, not only in capital raise, but also you've been able to grow revenue 188% year over year. You've grown to 14 employees. You were named one of the top 10 fastest growing startups in Chicago. And you've formed some really uh, valuable and unique partnerships from everyone to the Chicago Bulls to Huddle and so many others. So Honest Game just on an amazing trajectory. The company itself is all about bringing academic eligibility to high school students everywhere, helping them make sure that when they want, if they want to play a sport in college, they are not declined because they randomly found out last minute that their GPA was just like 0. 0.2 off or that the class that they took actually doesn't qualify based on the NCAA's coding system. So Honest Game is making sure that everyone has real-time eligibility updates so they know what they need to do in their own academic situation before it's too late. And there's a whole lot baked into that in, in like the ability to bring equity to underserved communities as well. So we're going to learn a whole lot more about Honest Game. But, but our topic today is something we haven't really ever covered on this show, and it's about like operations, specifically minimizing the chaos of startup life. Kim, once again, welcome to the show. Why is this on your mind? Why is this important to you? Yeah, thanks so much for having me. And, you know, you've been incredibly instrumental, um, your ability to sort of formulate, um, you know, how, how do we how do we tell our story in a way that's impactful um, and also simplify our story? So thanks for being with us from, you know, very early on when we really didn't know really even who we were yet. So <laughs> So grateful for you, um, Rajiv. So to answer your question, I think, um, you know, clearly operating, um, it's not the most sexy topic. Um, You know, everyone gets excited about startups. It's so exciting. And, you know, the possibility of raising money and a possible exit and changing the world and, you know, a whole variety of things. But um, I think it's, I think our operations and the way we've operated um, from a process perspective has kind of been our secret sauce. So I thought that it was important to share that, um, hopefully, um, within your, with your audience and other founders sort of wondering, um, you know, it sounds good that we've grown so much, even our, you know, our high school sales have grown, you know, over 600% year over year. And that's one of our key demographics, but I think it's important to understand that, you know, that sounds really good, but what is, what does it take to get there? Mm-hmm. We're going to dive a whole lot more into that as this conversation unfolds. Before we do, let's learn a little bit more about Kim the person now. Honest Game itself operates in the sports tech sector. Uh, I know you have a pretty strong personal connection to sports as well. Can you 
talk us through like what was your first sort of memory with sports and, and how have sports been influential in your own life? Yeah, sure. Uh, sport um, really did uh, change my life. I, I can tell you today I wouldn't be running this company without my experience. I grew up in uh, Los Angeles, uh, went to a small private high school um, in the, you know, uh, in high school in the late 80s. And at that time, you know, Title IX had already launched, but um, I don't, I think it was sort of just sort of getting some movement and some traction. And at that time, my high school didn't have a, uh, a lot of, they didn't have every girl's team. They always had every boy's team, but not every girl's team. And I was a, I really loved basketball. That was my passion. Um, huge. I was a huge Lakers fan. Um, this is when magic was out and Kareem. I remember my 16th birthday, like I got my name sort of in lights. Huh. It was a big, big thing in my life. Obviously they were pretty magical then. And, um, my high school didn't have a girl's team. And so, you know, that's what I wanted to do. I wasn't like going to cheer and there's nothing wrong with cheerleading. It just wasn't who I was. Um, and it wasn't, I mean, I like theater, but it wasn't my thing. So I was like, well, I want to play. So can I try out? And because I didn't, you know, because of title nine, um, I was able to try out. And so, uh, I was the first female in California to play boys varsity basketball and baseball in the California CIF division. Wow. What was that like? As, I mean, that's a, that's a huge personal win. I have to imagine, I mean, you got a bunch of teenage boys who are just like, oh, who's this girl trying to join the team? Like, were you accepted with open arms? Were you having to face a lot of crap along the way? Well, it's really funny that you say that because um, the anniversary of Title IX is coming up and they're going to celebrate some women in sports. There's a, a day coming up and they asked me to write a blog on this. And I reached out to an old uh, I wouldn't even call him a teammate. I reached out. He's actually a cop in LA now. He's been there 24 years. Um, and he, I met him because I played against him. And he said, I said, can you give me some of your memories, Sean? And I just literally got off the phone with him. And he said, yeah, I remember my coach, coach Bill rule. I said, coach Bill's crazy. There's a girl here. Like what, you know, and uh, whatever, it doesn't matter. And he goes, and then I remembered you played and you stole the ball. <laughs> and it goes, I will never forget that. And he said, and we went back to sort of our huddle. Uh, it was another team that we played against. And, and they said, yeah, well, you know, don't discount her. And their coach said, don't judge a book by its cover. That's really cool. And I think it's probably, it was an early sort of um, shifting of a mindset moment for that person. Did you find then maybe in other cases, just from, you know, from what you remember, were there people who were like, fouling you harder or kind of treating you like you didn't deserve to be on the court? Definitely. There was a, I got a lot of publicity. There was a bunch of LA times articles and uh, a bunch of articles, actually funny enough, they're still live today in the sense of like, they're, they're not archived and you'd think they would be. And I think there was some anger about that. Like, Oh, just because I was a girl, that kind of thing. Um, but I will tell you, and I said this earlier, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing if it wasn't for that experience. Um, what, we're, what we're doing now, we're a female founded startup, as you know, and um, I mean, you know the stats, I don't need to tell you, Rajiv, but um, the limited number of females that raise money. Mm -hmm. uh, my business partner is also a minority. And so I think that that experience for me, I, I, I think of the ball on the court is, I always thought of it as, as whatever opportunities come your way, that, that ball's not coming to you typically, unless it's a pass, you have to go get it. Mm -hmm. um, and I know this is maybe not the most popular, but if you're not fouling, you're doing something wrong. I mean, go after what you want. And I think, <laughs> you know, people say you can't, well, uh, that's their limitations, not yours. And so I think I wouldn't be here today. I think it was a pretty, um, pretty, you know, an, an event that really, you know, formulated who I am today. You know, and, and I'll tell you for me personally as well, like uh, sports has played such a crucial role in like the discipline I have, to, you know, I, so I ran track in high school and for a year in college and the amount of life lessons that were packed into those five years, right? The amount of, it, it's wild. The number of times I just like, am experiencing something today, but I can draw back a, like a direct line to like, oh, a similar thing happened when I was like 16 years old. And here's how I, you know, here's how I worked through it, right? And I, I think so much of that discipline mindset, the ability to like work towards a specific goal, see results and, and keep improving all those kinds of things have been influential for me. So I definitely understand, you know, firsthand just how much sports can influence you later on in life. The other aspect that I was kind of seeing there was, um, you know, as you, as you were able to step onto that court on a boys team, the first per, first woman ever, um, I think this theme of like equity has been really present for you. I mean, it's honest game today really helps, uh, with the idea of equity in terms of being able to make sure, you know, no athlete is, is 
told no simply because they, you know, they didn't know the process. Um, how do you feel equity has played a role in your life as, especially as you compare it to what you're doing today? Yeah, I think that I, I think it's a great question. I think, um, you know, we're, we, we started the startup older than, you know, some people we weren't in our twenties. And I think we were, we had a very, we kind of had a better idea of who we were, but also what, what, what legacy we wanted to leave on the world. And from that standpoint, it was really all about doing well by doing good. Capitalism isn't a bad thing, um, but it better come, you better make the world better while you're doing it. And frankly, even to take that further, if you're doing well while you're doing it, you, it's not an expense. <laughs> You'll make more money. It mm. actually will turn to be more profitable. And it's all this idea of we're a public benefit corp. Um, we're not a certified B corp, but we're a public benefit corp. It's really about this. Um, when investors invest in us, um, not everybody's going to be the right investor. I mean, they will look at our profit and you know our sales, but they also will look at well, how do we impact those students? And you know, where where was college access before? And how many more opportunities did you open up for the world? And what does that do for social mobility um, in, com- in in individual families and students, and then trickle down to communities and really, hopefully, the world? We we, we are international now as well. Yeah. Let's use that as sort of a segue into learning a bit more about Honest Game itself. Um, I gave a brief introduction. You talked about the Public Benefit Corp right there, but can you perhaps perhaps, um, just fill the audience's mind a little bit better with, you know, what is Honest Game and and how do you you help students? Sure. Yeah, we, um, I like to say we created Honest Game not to create a business, but to solve a problem. And that problem was that through the stats that we could find, almost a million kids a year um, we're not able to go to college, have post-secondary opportunities, um, and sport is a, a tremendous vehicle for that um, because they weren't academically eligible. And what we mean by that is not just necessarily they didn't have the the core requirements like for the NCAA of a 2.3 um, or a specific uh, you know standardized test score. It was because sometimes because they took classes that didn't count. That the NCAA, um, you know, will only accredit certain classes at every high school. They vary from high school to high school, and classes sometimes you think would be approved. Oh, that meets my English credits, or that meets my math credits. Don't count. And so, because of this, there were so many kids who couldn't afford college. I said almost a million a year that that weren't able to go and and, and take part of those opportunities. Beside the positive attributes of sport, um, and in any under resourced community, when you talk about equity, it's the numbers are really staggering. It's almost 50%, one in every two kids. Um, and in our country, I think, you know, we, our, our schools, um, it's, I mean, we've seen this during COVID. I mean, it's been so chaotic and virtual learning. Um, and, but we also have seen that there's a lot on their plates, a lot on counselors plates, a lot on high school athletic directors plates. There's a lot on all school administrators. And in particular, um, you know, in our country, uh, one in five kids in our country doesn't have a counselor. Um, and the average caseload of average counselors is over 400 kids. And when you look at that, now those counselors who barely have enough time to service what they do have to be, we, we entrust them in our country to be academic eligibility experts because the rules are very different. Um, and that's why this problem occurs. So our, our platform is a software platform, a B2B SaaS platform. And our goal is really to support and kind of put the student at the center and everyone in that student's village from the athletic director to the counselor, to the parent, to the coach, um, and make sure that that student athlete doesn't fall behind because it automates academic eligibility, like sort of on demand in real time to make sure that every student athlete has access to college. It's an unemotional tool. It's data-driven. My goal is not to make sure that this kid goes there. It's to make sure they have access to go. Mm. Let's use that to look to dive into our main topic now. And, and, you know, today's topic is all about minimizing the chaos of startup life. And the way you do that is through structure. Now, you know, when we were planning out this conversation, you talked about how you've implemented an EOS or an entrepreneur operating system. For those who don't know, that's popularized in the book Traction. It's popularized in a couple other books as well. Uh, but it's this idea, you know, you have like your iOS, your you know iPhone operating system or your Mac OS, your Mac operating system, your Windows. But as a business, you have your entrepreneur operating system. Can you just maybe like further define really what that means for you and your company? Sure. So I guess the best way of, and you did a great job explaining it, is that it's a playbook. I think that's the best way of explaining it. So we have the entire team um, all working virtually, doing different roles. And by using EOS, we make sure that we're all aligned and rowing in the right direction. 
Otherwise, if we have somebody doing one thing and somebody else doing another, it's really hard to measure success and to really have goals and outcomes. Can you talk through what maybe life was like at Honest Game before you implemented this? How many people was the company at that point? And sort of what was, what was the point at which you said, well, we have, to, we have to build this playbook? Yeah. So that's a funny question. Because um, this uh, Joyce and I, as co-founders, my co-founder Joyce Anderson, are very different. Um, she's an attorney by trade, um, and I I like to risk things and do new things. And I'm you know so the way that um, the way that EOS describes that is she's an integrator. She's the one that keeps the glue together, and I'm the visionary. That's how they kind of identify it. Um, there's lots of ways to look at it, but number one, that helped knowing ourselves. So we. We didn't, our communication styles, although we're ter- terrific partners, are very different. We think differently, we communicate differently, uh, which causes a lot of friction. And so before that, there was lots of friction. We actually instituted a safe word, which I don't think we've used in a long time whenever we couldn't communicate. So we wouldn't say things that were, you know, we didn't mean. Um, and that safe word is pineapple. And so we'd say pineapple, <laughs> pineapple moment. Um, and so, yeah, it was funny. And so I think what EOS has done, we were probably, I think about 11 people in when we decided to invest in it. It's it's the way we did it was we dove in. It's you don't have to have an implementer, but an implementer is somebody that you use to help you sort of lead that and it's 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 definitely a costly expense. But we decided that we care enough about what we're doing that it's not just all what you look like on the outside. Let's make sure that we really have a process for what we do and we have focus um and that we can measure those so that when we do need to pivot or when we do need to sort of alter things slightly we we'll get indicators it's proactive versus reactive. And we can tell, hey, let's talk about this. And there's a lot of things about it that have helped us. But in general, it's helped Joyce and I as co-founders get along much better and communicate within this framework. And we know our roles, which is great. And I think the team, startup life is chaotic anyway. So I think the team feels like, hey, there's a plan. You know, there's a plan, there's structure, there's organization. And I understand that. How did you first learn about it in the first place? And was it something that you decided or like were investors saying, no, you have to do this if you're, if we're going to invest in you? No, it wasn't investors. Actually, many of the investors haven't heard of it. Um, Mm -hmm. It was, which I've tried to recommend for other, other companies, but it's, um, it was actually one of our advisors um, who runs a really fantastic business, um, Tyree Burks, and he, it's called Players Health. And you know, we we have a pretty impressive group of advisors and we lean on them and we say, what is it that we don't know? Help us figure this out or we're struggling with this or we're struggling with that. And he's been incredibly instrumental. So he said, listen, I, I'm further along. I'm, I'm much further along than you guys. Um, he had done several large raises, but he said, this is something that's really been incredibly helpful and make sure that everybody's on the same page. Mm-hmm. Okay. So what aspects then would you say you know, your entre- and and I should also ask, do you, did, have you given, you know, the way Microsoft gave Windows a name, have you given your, your entrepreneur operating system a name? And then on top of that, what are the different aspects that this EOS touches within the business? Yeah, sure. So there's six core components of the business, um, mission, strategy, expectations, um, processes, accountability, outcomes, and procedures. I think that was six. Um, so those, that's how it it kind of encompasses the entire business. And when you think of EOS, it's really strengthening those key components, those six key components. So one way to think of it is that if you feel like you're strong on your mission and, um, your strategy is, you know, you're in a really good place where you want to go or expectations, processes, accountability, um, but, but something's not working. One of those six key components is probably weak. And so, for example, maybe it's your procedures. Maybe you have a lot, but you haven't communicated it in the right way. So when you look at your business sort of as a pinwheel and all six are around there and your business is at the center, you want to make sure all, all of them are strengthened. So maybe all of these things are good, but um, you know, one of those six elements isn't strong. And so that's where you kind of, and then you can say, okay, let's fix that. Let's, let's make sure we deal with it. So it's proactive, not reactive. It's also incredibly open and honest it encourages open and honesty. So we have, there's an issue section where you have to put your issues down. And the idea that there's always going to be issues is wonderful. And the idea about EOS is just try to smoke them out. You just try to, you just try to deal with them, talk about them. And sometimes when you're talking about them, like anything, you're not really talking about the root issue. So then you say, no, is that really the issue or is this the issue? 
And so you kind of go deep and you really try to solve these things that are difficult to solve instead of pretending they don't exist or that companies are perfect. Now, how do you take that and hedge it against, for example, like pettiness, right? Like how, how do you make sure that real issues are being discussed or, or, or versus someone just, you know, potentially just being petty about something or may, maybe being in their own head that day? I think it's the culture we've cultivated. Mm-hmm. Um, it's open and honest. So for example, we had an employee that um, we um, didn't have a position for anymore and had to let go. And we were going to a meeting with an implementer, uh, EOS leadership meeting. And we knew this was coming and we didn't want this, our team to hear it from somebody else. So we said, we really struggled. Should we share this? Is it not right? And we shared it with our team. So I think a lot of times, I mean, I, I, I think pettiness comes from f- people feeling that that they're not, that an organization is not transparent mm-hmm. and not honest. And I think because we're so real about what we're doing, we don't have that much. We don't, I don't, I don't even think, I think our team would, argue, would agree. We don't really have that issue. So to that extent, are you then, you know, you said you're so real with your team. Does that mean everyone on the team like knows all the numbers around like, you know, where, like revenue, but even like to the extent of like where the bank account is at, or are there certain things that, you know, have to be held back? I mean, I don't give people the bank account number if they don't need it, if it's not relevant to their role, but we do, um, you know, we have a quarterly all hands, we have an annual all hands, every single um, quarter, the leadership team and all the other departments get together and they form what they call rocks, which are their objectives for the quarter. Um, And why are they important? And we get, and then how are we going to meet them? And what does that mean? How do you back up? Do you want to meet specific sales numbers? How do you get there? So yeah, most things are, are pretty open and honest. I mean, and even how much cash we have in the bank or what our runway is, our burn rate. Yeah. I mean, we're very open and honest. I mean, we don't intend to like scare people or, but we, but we're creating a culture where we're building this company together. Yeah. Yeah. And, and to, to clarify, I meant, yeah, cash in the bank, not literally giving out account numbers. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yes. Yes. We, yeah. 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 We do. We do. Yes. Um, can you, okay. So say more about, you said, you said everyone comes to these quarterly meetings with their, with their rock, which is like their goal you know, why a rock? Is there, is there some intentional symbolism to that? Uh, you know what? I'm not Gina Wickman, so I didn't create it. So I'm not hundred <laughs> percent sure, but I think, you know, think of a rock as, you know, there's some, it's just a, it's, I guess you'd call it, um, there's verbiage vernacular that they use and using that is helpful. So mm. one of them is your, your leadership meeting and they call it your L10 and it's an every week meeting and each department has one and the leadership team has one. And it's, um, there's rules about it. You have, they have to start on time. They have to end on time. You have to start with data. When you when you report on something, you don't go on and on. You say on track, off track. Um, and even if you're not done with a meeting, but it times up, the meeting's done. Yeah. Um, you know. So it, it 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 there's there's a process. There are rules around that. Uh, and rocks is, as you as you asked is part of that. And that's you know what are the four or five things that I, that are the most important things for me to achieve for that quarter. The on track, off track thing you meant, you kind of, you mean, you very casually said it, but I think it's very important. Um, what might the, you know, if you're recapping results, what might that look like in actual execution in a meeting? How might someone say this, you know, utilize on track or off track? So usually there's somebody leading the meeting and then somebody else running the accountability software or the operating system. And as we're doing that, we've, we've agreed as a team, we've all aligned. Yes, I agree. You agree, Rajiv. We've all agreed that whatever that, whatever that metric is earlier on in the quarterly planning, that that is it. So, um, and then we have a data component also as well that says, you know, you know, what should our churn rate be? Or, you know, what's our ARR? Whatever that may be. And those are things that we track, certain things we track weekly, monthly, annually, hmm. um, and quarterly, of course. And so, if it's your turn, Rajiv, and you're handling marketing for the company or communications for the company, you have certain metrics that you have thought are the most important that you've gotten alignment with the rest of the team. So if you report on them and they're not on track, you're not going to go on and on and say, well, it's not on track because last week schools were closed and then they were closed because it was COVID. And then that, that isn't, I mean, you can, you can share that later if it becomes an issue, but really your goal is to say this part of the business, this metric I am tracking is they're on track or off track. If it needs further discussion, you move it to the issues list. It's called IDS. It's the issues list. Interesting. Okay. So you just basically report yes or no. It's like very binary up front. And then if it merits discussion, it's a separate part of the conversation, but you're not taking time away right there. 
Right. And then when you say a separate part of the conversation, it gets added to this um, issues list. And the issues list, as you can imagine, can be quite long. So then you take, you take some time and you say at the beginning of the meeting and also typically before the meeting to look at what are the most important issues you want to talk about because you can't talk about everything. Sometimes you might talk about one big issue the entire time. And that doesn't mean it's not successful. It probably is successful. It means that it was the most pressing issue to talk about. What do you do then? You know, because you said, you know, your meetings start and end on time. What do you do then if something still needs to be discussed and, you know, your meeting was supposed to end at 11 and it's 1059 and you still have some more to go? There's always more to go. (laughs) There's always more to go. But as a team, aligning that, that leadership team or that department Everybody was aligned that these three things that were going to be what they were talked about. So it's not that it's not important. It just wasn't the most pressing thing. Um, and if it needs to be handled, it can, hand, it can be handled on the side. I mean, the idea is that most of the things happen or should happen during your leadership meeting. But sometimes you're, or, you know, you're during your L10 for the week. Sometimes though, you do have to have off meetings just because something comes up. What's really like what, what I'm hearing a lot of, and I mean this in a good way, is like it's this commitment to being like ruthless about the structure. Not ruthless with each other, but the fact that there is this predefined structure that everyone has essentially put their hand in to say, yes, I'm committed to this. And so then everyone has agreed that, you know, we're not going to be beholden to like individual opinions of how things should be run. It's like we've all like the structure is what prevails. And so everyone just has to live up to that. Is that is that kind of on point? That is 100 percent on point. And it actually made me think of something, which is, yeah, we are ruthless about structure because we can control structure, much else in startup life you can't control. How would you relate this to, or compare this to how a basketball practice is run from your own experience, you know, being being on a team? I think it's actually a great analogy. I think, you know, people show up, they go to the, you know, they go to the vending machine, they grab the soda, they sit down, they're excited to see you play, but it's all the work you do to get to that game. The raise is the raise. That's not the, the work. It takes work, but it's what you've done to get up to that raise. And I know it sounds like it. It's not the most sexy thing, but it's, as I said, as I said on the beginning, it's the secret sauce. Yeah. We're going to continue this conversation a little bit more. As, and I want to talk more about this idea of like the rule setting and beyond. But before we do that, let's just take a quick sidebar and talk about a better way that you can be measuring your website analytics. And I want to know listeners, if you've been using Google analytics Are you down with it? Like, do you love it? Are you so-so on it? Or are you like, this is really effing frustrating because understanding where and why you lose site visitors before they convert is just flat out hard. And with Google Analytics, I know there's always some integration issue or you have to sort through a mountain of data just to figure out what's causing your leads to drop off. It's not fun, plain and simple. And that's why I was really excited to learn that there's a better way to measure website analytics. And that better way is Oribi. Oribi is a unique marketing analytics tool that captures all the events visitors perform on your website without using code. Oribi enables you to analyze visitor behavior patterns, build smart funnels, and get tons of insights so you always know what your next step is. And what that means is you're able to understand your visitors and know what to change in order to convert more, which then means no more blind spots on your websites and your lead conversion. Now, as a partner of the show, Oribi has a cool offer for you. So you can start your free trial today by going to oribi.io slash today. That's O-R-I-B-I dot I-O slash today. But as a partner of the show, use the coupon code HYPEMAN, all one word, H-Y-P-E-M-A-N, coupon code HYPEMAN, and get 20% off of any paid plan. So it's oribi.io slash today to start the free trial and use the coupon code HYPEMAN for 20% off any paid plan. Today on Startup Hype Man, the podcast, we are with Kim Michelson, co-founder and CEO of Honest Game, and we're talking about minimizing the chaos of startup life, specifically in the way Honest Game has done it in implementing an entrepreneur operating system. Now, Kim, you talked about the sort of the analogy of running this EOS and running a startup to being on a basketball team where you know what people see is the game, but they don't see the practice that went in. They don't see the sweat. Kind of fitting, actually, that we're using this analogy. I, I don't know if you see behind me, but I've got the Kobe Bryant book behind me. We're I recording do. this on January 26th, uh, the, you know, the t- two years to the date that he passed. Um, so I think there's actually, it's fitting that we're having this conversation today. Um, 
And you said like, you know, it's all the work that got to the raise or it's all the work that led up to getting to that point. Can you talk through like, how do you account for any like failure points that might happen within the system? And, and so I guess if we were to use the basketball analogy, uh, you know, Dennis Rodman just decided to not show up to practice for like three days, right? Um, how do you account for like the startup version of that when someone's maybe not pulling their weight or not living up to the, the not living up to the EOS? Yeah, well, if Dennis Rodman didn't show up to his practice, then you'd have a, a weakness in one of the six key components, and that would be people. So, you know, usually it goes down to these, as I mentioned, six key components. Um, but I think that what's really, really interesting is that when everybody's aligned using an operating system, and we're using EOS, but whatever that may be, um, again, as you mentioned earlier, we don't really have pettiness, um, and everybody's pulling their weight because it's so visible and transparent. And when they're not, it's also really visible and transparent. Mm. So it's, it, it, it uncovers issues much quicker. It's very proactive, especially if you're tracking the right things and it becomes really obvious. It's almost like, I hate to say this, but in, in a startup like us, I mean, there's not really anywhere to hide. It's all out there. Mm. Is there any point at which, or, or do you believe, right? Let me ask it that way. Do you believe there's a point at which you can be too transparent? Yeah. I mean, I think if, um, you know, if I gave everybody our bank account number, I mean, people have to know what they need to know, but in order for them, you know, to, you know, our, you know, part of this, I think that the better way to answer that question is one of the key components, as I mentioned, is, is the sort of idea of vision and mission. And we had, we spent a lot of time on that. And Many, many years ago when I was doing that stuff, I used to think, oh, people just say, you know, and no, we went through a rigorous process to say, what are we? You know, you can only have whatever they are, those five are. So because we live that also, we live it, we talk about it. Um, it's very ingrained in our culture, mm. you know, our, you know, our, our mission and vision. And it, it sort of by, you know, natural selection a bit kind of weeds out people, for example, that don't fit that culture. So our transparent culture isn't for everyone. Um, so that's a great, great point. And not everybody fits our culture, but this is our culture. And so it enables us to make better hiring decisions, people to feel much more, more rewarded because it really is like fitting like a glove. Um, and except for, I mean, I think we, we're, we're open and honest about mostly everything. The only thing that we're not open and honest about are talking about other employees to other employees. Um, we would never do that. Um, or sharing salaries or, you know, all the things that are pretty basic. I mean, that just, that wouldn't be, there's no purpose to that. Sure, sure. Have you as a company created core values uh, already? Oh, yes. That's part of, you know, um, that is part of this whole EOS process. Before you kind of do this, you have to know who you are. And yeah, go ahead. Okay. So, well, then my follow-up is, you know, what are the core values? And then, and did the, is it the core values live up to the EOS or the EOS has to live up to the core values? I think that the, it all starts with the core values, okay. if that answered that. Um, so, you know, and we went through, as I mentioned before, a really, really rigorous process to sort of figure out what are our core values. And I can't remember what our implementer had said, but it's, it's actually really funny because people can say things like, I don't know, what, what do you value the most in your business? And you can say, you know, oh, I, you know, I value this. And you're just like, really, do we value that? Um, and we actually had to um, actually also rate each other based on how in, in the team, how we fit up to those, um, to how we fit up to those core values. So um, we, you know, our values are about equity, uh, equity and access, um, honesty. Um, so we, these are kind of our core values. I and mean, when we kind of, we like to say that um, we push the boundaries, this is a team that pushes the boundaries um, for what is possible for ourselves and also our customers. Uh, probably one of our, our biggest core values is grit. Mm. Um, and maybe because we're both former athletes, we, we have empathy, but we also are not about excuses. It's okay if you mess up, just own it and let's move on. Yeah. And then just let's, let, let's not, let's, let's just not repeat it. Yeah. You know, so I, I'm actually, I recently went through a core values exercise myself and creating values for startup hype man as we start to grow. Um, and still, still fine tuning them. So I'm not at the point of being able to like share what they are because they're not finalized yet. But it's funny how the initial list was like 30 values, 
And then from there, it, it, you know, it was just like, well, but that's kind of saying the same thing as this, or yeah, that was a thought in my mind, but it's not necessarily a core value. And then, you know, from there you just start to cull it down. And I think now it's down to like five or six. Um, but the, but it's interesting how, unless you actually take the time to sit down and actually think through this stuff in a structured way, if it's all just like in your head, I just think it's really hard to be able to lead other people because there's not, there's no shared understanding or shared standard. If it's like, well, you didn't do it this way because in my head, you're supposed to do it another way. Like how could they ever possibly succeed as opposed to, well, here's how we operate as a company, you know, or, or here's the value. Like, like grit is one of our values. And I don't feel like you're, you're, I don't feel like you're embodying grit right now. That's different if it's a thing you can point to as opposed to a thought you have in your mind that they are supposed to know that you have, right? We, 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 point, to, we point it all the time. Every single time we have a meeting, we read our core, we have a core values speech. We read our core values speech and we identify folks in the company that are meeting those core values. Um, and I mean, the best way that I could describe it, kind of like how you said is, do you remember when you were a kid and you played the game telephone? Mm-hmm. And the funny part about that game is that you create a message, funny or not, and by the time it gets around the circle, it's a different message. So I think of that when I think of our core values. I mean, you can't just assume that the person in the middle is going to hear it. You have to deliver it. You have to be clear. You have to be concise. You have to be honest because people are, employees are smart. If you sort of say like, I have this core value, but it doesn't really embody you mm-hmm. or the culture that you're creating, like transparency, but it's a company that's not transparent really. Um that's not going to do anything for you. It's not going to do buy-in. So you really have to live it and own it and kind of wear it like a pair of jeans. Yeah. And yeah. call yourself out and have others call you out and you call others out when you're not living up to it. It's a creed. Well, I like that comparison to the pair of jeans. Having said that, is is an entrepreneur operating system, you know, jeans get worn in, right? Over time. Is, is your EOS designed to just to be something that is created and set in stone or is there is there room to make modifications along the way yeah i mean you make them every quarter when you create your rocks so there are new rocks for example we were really focusing deeply on four-year colleges and now we think you know there is definitely a value prop there but it's actually stronger with uh, two-year colleges so now our rocks will move there so no i mean you have to you have to mean i mean i i want to be really clear about it it helps provide structure as a startup just by nature, there's, you know, you have to be flexible. And that's sort of like the antithesis of that. So I think <laughs> we're trying to put some structure in, but there's always going to be, um, you know, I think it's a, we're always going to be learning. Yeah. But and, even that notion yeah. of being flexible, right? In order to be flexible, there has to be some origin point, right? Like if you think of like a ruler and it bends back and forth, even like a flexi ruler, it's going to bend more back and forth, but there's some sort of like center of gravity within that, something that it's moving off of. And that's what I think you're getting at here, as opposed to if everything is just kind of happening and there's no real center of gravity in, amidst all of this, you, you, you may think you're flexible, but really what you're doing is, I don't know, I guess you're, you're, you're just running around aimlessly. <laughs> You may think you're flexible, but you're aimless. You're, you're, um, you're working hard, not necessarily smart. And do you feel that this has helped, um, you know, one, one of the biggest things that happens, and especially in the first maybe three to five years of a startup is, is lots of pivots. Has this helped guide pivoting or reduce the amount of pivoting? Yes. Um, so how I like to think of a startup, and I know they use the word pivot, I for us, I think that's a probably an extreme word. I mean, I think of it as a sailboat. So when you're on a sailboat and you have your, you know, you have to continually adjust the sail because you don't know where the wind's coming. Hmm. So they're little fractions of moves. You know, they're not necessarily wild moves from one. I mean, it could be if it's a massive storm, you know. And so, yeah, I guess COVID could have been that way for us, but it wasn't considering a bad, massive storm. But I think of it as like little, you know, little small fractions of movement that you, and then you're looking at them. And and so I view it more like that. Not that there's, you know, I just think pivot is a word we all use, but I think it's also, you know, it's an old, there's an old saying, and I'm going to say it wrong because I always get these things wrong, but um, 
you know, if all, do you remember that old story? It was like a, a story about, um, a storm and there was all these like not seashells but like clams that kind of went up on the water and yeah castaway and- starring tom hanks <laughs> <laughs> oh my god that's hilarious right okay so picture so picture <laughs> picture castaway then picture castaway and all of a sudden you're looking at it and going oh my god if i don't throw that clam and her muscle in it's gonna die but then you're looking all of a sudden down the beach and you say but there's five million of them is it really going to make a difference but you're like, yeah, it made a difference to that one. So I think when you think of those little pivots, those little things might seem little, but they add up. And that's what real progress is. And progress we know is not linear. It's a, it's a process. It's a journey. Mm. I have one more question here before we begin our wrap up. So, you know, the company has been growing really well. Again, you're one of the top 10 fast growing startups in Chicago over the last year. Uh, I I expect that growth, that pace of growth to continue, perhaps even accelerate more. How do you see your EOS um, continuing to serve this company as you grow and scale? Yeah, I know that's a really good question. I think it's, um, we started with an implementer, which is really, really costly. It's somebody who's trained to implement, Um, but it's very costly, especially in a startup budget. And so I think we did about... Um, five or six sessions with this implementer. And now we're just, now we feel like we're skilled enough to lead it on our own. So I think, I don't, I don't see it going away. I just think that we feel more confident in being able to lead and manage that process um, and be able to roll it out to new team members. Let's begin our wrap up now. First off, where can our listeners find you, Kim, and learn more about you and and learn more about Honest Game? Yeah, you can check out honestgame.com www.honestgame.com to learn more. And um, okay. And if you want to go to and our social media <laughs> ch- channels, you can say uh, it's at Honest Game Cares. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, no, it was fine. I just, I, I literally didn't know if you were like, if, if that was the end of the sentence. You want to know what? I wasn't sure either. There you go. <laughs> Uh, Kim, who is one person who you want to shout out today? Could be a colleague, an employee, a mentor, an advisor, anybody who's helped you on your journey. I think the one person I'll shout out today is the person that introduced us to EOS, Tyree Burks. So do a shout out to him. Um, And um, he's amazing. And he's the one that his company is called Players Health. I'm sure you can find it online at probably www.playershealth.com. But he's um, been instrumental. And I also want to do a shout out to him because I think as an entrepreneur, you got to help others. Um, you know, and so I think he's taught us and now we're mentoring other companies. And I think that's wonderful. Let's now do our final lessons and takeaways from this conversation. So I'll go first, then I'll toss it to you. Our top one or two lessons or takeaways or topic today was minimizing the chaos of startup life. Now, obviously, everything was built within the confines of talking about a you know, having an operating system as a company. Um, to me, I think the the biggest thing that came out of this conversation for me was the it's the idea of transparency, but ha- being transparent with yourself first. In the, in the sense of knowing, knowing what your tendencies are and because you're aware of that, being able to create a system that either plays to that, the good things, but, but helps you from falling victim to the bad tendencies that you might have. And then that'll help as you grow a team to really have some, some good structure. Kim, top one or two lessons or takeaways for the listeners? Number one lesson takeaway was that you haven't done a topic like this. And I think that there's things that entrepreneurs want to talk about that seem fun. And as I've said, the word sexy, Um, and this isn't the most fun, but it's probably the most, one of the most critical um, to moving your business, you know, you know, making sure that you're not part of that uh, 90% of startups that fail. And so I think that, you know, I think that it's important. And if you want to be an entrepreneur, do the work and don't be afraid to invest in that stuff. It's kind of like your water heater. It's not so exciting, but like you'd rather do siding on your house, but, but you need the water heater. And so just invest in the right things. And, you know, there's a lot of hype, but just cut. If you do the right things, um, I think your chance of success, a success is, is, is much higher. My final question, which is how we end every episode on this show. Fill in the blank, Kim. Entrepreneurship is blank. So fun. Say more on that. Oh, I just love it. I'm built for risk. I love innovation. If I, I tell my co-founder a lot, if I, 
if I, if there's not enough innovation, um, you know, I, again, if I do 10 ideas, probably one or two might be really, really, really big ideas. The other two, you know, the other eight that I still created might not be great, but I love innovation so much. It's what makes our world go around. It's what brings us interconnected from a global perspective. It's what, um, how anything important ever got changed and created. And so I feel really lucky and blessed I can do this and um, make, do my part to hopefully not only for my own legacy, but hopefully to, to change the lives of millions of students. I'm, I'm grateful I get to do this. And I think entrepreneurship is just, I think anybody who goes for it and tries, it's, I'm super proud of them and it's so honorable. She is Kim Michelson, co-founder and CEO of Honest Game. Kim, thank you so much for joining today on Startup Hype Man, the podcast. Thanks for having me. That does it for this week's episode. Thank you so much for listening. If you liked what you heard, go ahead and leave a rating and review in your podcast app or do us one better. Hit the share button. Send this episode to one friend who you think needs to hear it. While you're on your way out, don't forget to follow Startup Hype Man on Instagram and LinkedIn at Startup Hype Man. And remember, you can also connect with today's guest as well. They left their contact info. They love hearing if what they shared helped you in any way. StartupHypeMan.com is the place to catch the full 17 season archive and learn all about how to pitch your startup. We'll see you next week, but until then, stay hyped. Raj Nation out.